Hi, welcome to our presentation. My name is Fiona Hartley Kroger. You'll be hearing from my colleagues Matthew Colmer, Lloyda Pan, and Isabella Viega a little bit later on. Our project is entitled Folklore, Place, and Song Digital Ethnomusicological Mapping of Corridos of Mexico and the Rio Grande. There are two parts to our project. We have our data set. Um, in which we have metadata and the text of over 100 corridos. And then we have the map, which is one instantiation of the data. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate one possible project that could be done with the data. Uh, we really welcome your feedback, especially as concerns the future of this particular project, as well as what we might do with the data and how we might maintain it going forward. So uh, please, we welcome your feedback. All right. So first of all, what are corridos? Corridos are narrative songs uh, popular in the American Southwest and in Mexico. Gloria Anzaldúa describes them as chief cultural myth makers. These are narrative songs that talk about uh, folk heroes, events, places. They're a form of folklore. They're how a particular people narrate themselves and affirm their identities. So these songs work as bearers of identity and of social relations. Now, place is very important to the way that these songs create identity. They are specific, they are localized, they establish and um, promulgate the identity of a particular community. But when they get written down, as scholars tend to do when we want to study something, all of this local context really gets flattened out. So what we're trying to do in our remediation of this oral tradition is to recenter the local context that has been abstracted. And here to tell you about that now is Isabella. Thank you, Fiona. So we decided to map our curidos with Arcus and then embed our map into an Omeka site. So the pins on the map span several countries, although they are primarily situated in Mexico, as you could see in this first image here. So when a user clicks on a pin, the heading shares the location and the body shares information about the curidos in our data set as you can see in these last two images here. So different styles of pins reveal different kinds of information to users. The sewing pin you see here marks locations and landmarks mentioned within the text, municipalities, states, regions, streets, buildings, oceans, beaches, you name it. Our other two types of pins note the places from which or in which corridos were encountered. The push pin here marks the place of performance or recording, and the cross you see here marks the place of print publication. So our mapping modality underscores our three general frameworks for this project. First, we wanted to center geographical place, very simply. Pins can highlight the significance of place by noting reoccurrence, lesser known locations, or locations that no longer exist in maps or at all. So in a way, our project might be an entryway into rediscovering lost geographical histories. Second, our project approaches place as a locus for myth-making. These corridos track the movement of historical and cultural figures across towns and regions. Corridos memorialize local tragedies, historical conflict, mythological figures, new technology, violence of colonialism, and they do so by grounding these events and figures in place. So these pins reveal that cultural and regional identities are rooted in geographical history as well. So third, our pins note the locations in which corridos were recorded, performed, and printed to track the trans media nature of these songs. By establishing publication location as an important factor in studying corridos, we hope to understand transmedia narratives and transmission, which might help us understand things like oral tradition, literacy, colonialism, technology, and historical media more broadly. Uh, so now Matthew will tell you about our data set. Hi, I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm just going to talk really briefly about our data set. Uh, so uh, we're up to about 170 some corridos. Uh, and we used a number of different sources to sort of compile them. Uh, we uh, started with the Library of Congress's holdings uh, and identified audio as well as uh, OCR extracted TXT files, as well as uh, PDF images, uh, and brought all those together into our data set. Uh, we also looked at La Opinion, uh, the LA-based newspaper, and found numerous examples uh, as dig digitized texts uh, from the early 20th century. And we looked to... Uh, the Hathi Trust and identified a two volume anthology that contained numerous examples of corridos as well. Um, so we brought all those together uh, and that was really the uh, initial challenge because 
course, there's no central database uh, for all the corridos in the world. Um, in fact, our project is probably the closest thing to that. So we had to build that from the ground up and identifying sources uh, and bringing together different uh, uh, different data. Uh, this also highlighted the challenges challenges of uh, dealing with multimedia data uh, and you know dealing with audio MP3 files versus TXT files, uh, which have completely different capacities. Uh, and then really thinking about and defining our geospatial metadata uh, it was an initial challenge and one that's sort of ongoing. Uh, to identify locations and geospatial data, uh, we used a Python program uh, and a package called Spacey, which uh, has a lot of uh, NLP capacity. Uh, and we created lists uh, of named entities in the Corridos, and they were fairly accurate uh, at identifying named entities, but less so uh, in separating sort of places versus people versus organizations and so on. So we had to go through and double check that. And that's one thing that uh, we're hoping to sort of hone in our model uh, moving forward is using the, the data set that we already have to build a training model that's more accurate for Kudidos and, and allow us to scale up that part of the project. Um, also finding more data in general is another step that we're thinking about moving forward. Um, and then also thinking about how longitudinal and latitudinal data could be sort of cross-referenced uh, programmatically um, rather than having to do that by hand, which was another time-consuming part of our our project. Um, so those are things we're thinking about next steps, um, but I'll let Lloyd close it out. So thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Lloyda and I will be talking about our publishing process and future plans we have for this project. All right, so we currently have our project hosted on our Omeka S site and we have our data set, um, I believe in Google Drive, and we have our code kind of uploaded to one of our GitHub accounts. So this by far is not the most ideal situation. We're definitely thinking about how to best preserve our project. Um, one of the options we're considering currently is publishing with iOpen, the Illinois Open Publishing Network, which would have a ton of benefits. Namely, we'd have a DOI issued to our project, uh, which would increase accessibility and discoverability, which is fantastic. The iOpen team um, would also lend its tech expertise, which would kind of help us polish up our project and get it to where we want it to be. They will also have uh, really great marketing branch arm that could help us uh, widen our audience and get more eyes on our project, which would be fantastic. Uh, we've already met with the iOpen team for an initial consultation, and they had a great idea about how to preserve our data set and code, which would be to submit it to the Illinois Data Bank, which again, would make sure that our data set and our code would have a DOI associated with it. And it would also kind of um, allow our data set and code to be more accessible to Illinois scholars um, and also just scholars in general. So after our consultation with iOpen, there are definitely some questions that arose from those conversations. The first is um, just how much we want to develop our project. We definitely have a really good uh, starting point if we want to continue to add data or to create an entirely new iteration of our project. So that's something that we have to come to an agreement. Um, it's very exciting and we have a lot to work with. So getting it to a point where all of us are satisfied with it um, is going to be kind of difficult. The other question that arose was how to incorporate community engagement, depending on what our final, final iteration of our project is gonna look like, will absolutely dictate what community engagement looks like for our project. And then the third question that we're currently grappling with is um, what a bilingual iteration of our project would be. So we currently don't really have um, a bilingual site. It's very much just English focused. And um, the, having a bilingual site will kind of uh, bring the issues of, for example, copy editing, which um, iOpen has workarounds around, but it's not quite ideal. They're best suited to work with English projects, English language projects. Um, so this would be something we'd have to consider. Um, we definitely want some sort of bilingual aspect to our project. We're just not quite sure what our capabilities would be in terms of doing that. 
Um, but we're very excited for you to uh, kind of look at our project and hear any ideas you have that might help us with these challenges. Any thoughts you have would be really greatly appreciated. Thank you.